Well, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Eads, the head of school, and I am delighted to welcome you to very special Talon Talks. Shortly, we'll hear from our three distinguished panelists. We've got Jay Vias, Stan Irk, and Lisa Healthman joining us today. But I wanna first uh, thank our advancement office for putting together this remarkable opportunity for our alumni and for our community. You know, learn a lot this afternoon, I have no doubt. Uh, to begin our program, I'm going to share a little bit about how the Kincaid School, your school has responded to the pandemic. It's been a highly unusual year. Obviously I'm new, but I know that we've had to do things very differently than we've had in the past to make sure that our students, faculty, staff, and our uh, community is safe as we possibly can be uh, operating a school in the middle of a pandemic. Um, first thing I would tell you is really, there's no playbook on this. As a head of school, one of the things that I've always said is that whenever I'm confronted with a challenge, I always consult other peer heads of school because uh, usually I'm not the first one to encounter such a challenge, but this one's obviously new that we've negotiated and navigated together and I'm proud of the efforts of Kincaid. We've been able to do so really through a couple of means. Number one is um, expertise. We've assembled a terrific uh, COVID response task force. We originally called a reopening task force and then once we were opening, we were open, we rebranded it <clears throat> as a uh, COVID response task force. We've got some amazing expertise of medical personnel, um, admin, faculty, uh, staff, board members, and they've been uh, providing wonderful expertise uh, to me as the head of school. Secondly is resources. We are very fortunate at Kincaid to be able to couple the, such great expertise uh, with resources and able to modify our campus and our procedures to do the best we can to keep our, our community safe. Um, Kincaid has spent over $2.2 million in COVID uh, mitigation uh, strategies. And really the punchline of my brief presentation to kick us off today is that um, we have no known on-campus transmission of COVID-19, which is really an extraordinary thing when you consider that we've had at least 2,000 people here every day on campus um, since early October. We're very pleased with and proud of that. We've developed a very elaborate contact tracing uh, measures. Our team has been trained by Johns Hopkins University, which is why we're able to say that with great confidence. I'd love to show you some uh, stats and photos. Go ahead, that'd be great. Thank you, Carly. Um, we've erected outdoor learning environments, uh, classrooms and dining facilities. Seven tenths are all over Kincaid now, which uh, accounts for about 8,700 square feet. Believe it or not, we're talking 74 truckloads, like moving trucks of furniture supplies that we had to remove from campus to de-densify our campus so that we could have the requisite six feet in all of the classrooms. Uh, signage everywhere, which you'll see photos of that in just a moment. And then a lot of PPE, you can see those numbers there. Go ahead, next slide. Thank you. So what you're seeing there on the left is our uh, learning space of our youngest students. And obviously different than the norm because we had to remove so much from the classroom in order to create these individual learning spaces. You see some of the plexiglass barriers that we've used. We've also had to claim additional learning space in order to have the six foot uh, physical distancing. You're seeing a photo there in the middle school library where that space is now actually um, a couple of classrooms. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. Great, very good. That photo on the left there is a little bit depressing, but again, we had to remove a lot of furniture in order to have the desk there. You'll find dots on the ground where uh, we mark where chairs are supposed to sit. The photo on the right is in our uh, dining uh, learning center there, the dining hall. And you can see it looks very different, but we're able to um, safely as possible eat with the proper uh, distancing as well. Next slide. Thank you so much. On the left is one of those uh, tents, uh, again, that are being used for uh, teaching, learning, small group gatherings, uh, as well as eating. On the right, uh, weather here, luckily we're in Houston versus the Northeast where most of the time we've had great weather other than the, the polar vortex recently, but uh, middle school there is obviously using some outdoor spaces to eat as well. Next slide. Thank you so much. We also hired additional uh, nurses, health uh, service providers to support us this year. The contact tracing is an incredibly complex 
uh, time intensive, uh, laborious process. So we've hired more personnel uh, as part of that, uh, the resource allocation that we've done, added additional clinics in multiple places on the, the, the campus. And really what I wanna highlight there is the uh, second from the bottom bullet uh, the school spent invested $350,000 on a very sophisticated air filtration uh, system for the entire campus uh, to help us with airflow. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much. So there's just a couple quick shots inside the, the clinic with different dividers. And on the right, you can see, you know, isolation, isolation curtains. We've had a, a, a well side and a sick side and, and some very um, comprehensive protocols to make sure we're isolating, separating, uh, and then ultimately if needed, quarantining individuals. So go ahead, next slide. And then again, I, that first slide I shared so showed some of the data on the signage. Um, you'll find walking through the halls of Kincaid, um, again, so that the students aren't walking at each other, uh, physically colliding or coming into close contact. There are certain uh, uh, pathways, down halls, upstairs, into restrooms, out of restrooms, you'll, you'll, you'll find it everywhere in every nook and cranny and outside as well. There's a little bit more of the signage there. That's the athletic uh, hallway there. Y'all probably recognize that. Even the dining hall, so people um, aren't coming in and out of multiple doors, but it's all one way of entry and exit. Next. And then again, this is our uh, student learning center here, the dining hall. And again, a very uh, traffic flow patterns are very clearly marked. Uh, so you follow some of these barriers here. Um, teachers were offered uh, the opportunity for some of these plexiglass barriers. Um, protecting our faculty and staff is obviously paramount for us. And so that's what you see there. There's some contactless uh, water bottle fillers. Um, and so we've done that. Our, um, before you move on, the dining hall, we obviously have some uh, very specific uh, protocols that we've used with sage dining. Uh, you know, buffet style is over for now and individually uh, wrapped boxes is how that's done to keep uh, the dining uh, safe as possible. You'll find, you know, hand hygiene is emphasized everywhere uh, in, in all the classrooms as they come in, as they leave, cleaning off the desk between classes and much more with uh, sanitation, including regular use of uh, electrostatic sprayers. Um, and that is just, there's a regular rotation of that. And then there's also a targeted surgical use of that um, in the event um, of, we're made aware of a concern for in a particular area, okay? Um, there, that photo there on the left is in the Ogilvy lobby there, the CATS uh, center there, uh, the, right outside the Brown Auditorium. That's where uh, it's an overflow for middle school dining is what, what that is. So we're actually have some food set up, services set up in the ticket box office there. The right is the black box, which has been converted to additional learning space with proper distancing. Next. And then on the left there is down in the lower school, the, what we call the big room marked for distancing. Interestingly enough, uh, our uh, upper school orchestra um, practices in there when the lower school is not present. Uh, dog at gym there on the right is additional flex space. Um, again, dining, but also when students aren't able, because we can only have so many in each classroom, sometimes students have to zoom in from the flex space. And last bit here is um, athletics. I just wanted to say before I mentioned the arts, we ha had all of our season so far, fall, winter and spring at Kincaid in middle and upper school, the exception is the um, wrestling. Uh, and then we also produced an outdoor musical and that's what these last photos are right here. Um, and we even had a, it's, it's hard to build community but we did pull off a neat social event, this outdoor opera ski event with real snow brought in and physically distance uh, measures. I'd love to go on but I wanna leave time for our panelists while you're here today. But I, I am grateful for uh, our, our task force and all the advisors that have helped us keep Kincaid open and as we finish this year. So with that, I will proudly and gratefully throw it back to uh, Jay or introduce Jay Vias to lead us to our Talon Talks today. Thank you, Jay. Wonderful, thank you, Jonathan. And it's, uh, it's absolutely wonderful for, um, uh, for you and uh, Tom and Carly to be hosting this um, uh, Kincaid Talent Talks. We are super excited to uh, spend the remainder of the hour telling you as much as we know about uh, COVID vaccines. Um, I'll, on this uh, on this Talent Talk, we I will be um, accompanied by uh, Stan Irk, um, who was from the class of 1966, and Lisa Helfman um, from the class of 1993. So let me give you a brief bio 
on the two of them, and I'll give you a brief bio of myself, and then I'll go through a few uh, um, uh, kind of uh, programming notes, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm really delighted that um, that both Stan and Lisa uh, accepted our invitation to be here. Stan graduated, as I mentioned, from Kincaid in 1966. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois and his uh, MBA at the University of Chicago Boot School of Business. Um, he served previously as a president and CEO of Procept, a publicly traded immunology company, and then vice president of corporate development at Integrated Gen uh, Genetics, which is now Genzyme, and has been in management positions within Baxter International. He's had extensive experiences in the field of vaccine and infectious disease, and he joined Novavax, where he currently is, in 2009, and was named their president and CEO um, in, two, in April of 2011, and I'm sure he's going to have a, a lot of exciting things to tell us about the, vac the COVID-19 vaccine that they've been working with. Um, uh, so I'll speak first, and then Stan will speak second, and then, um, uh, uh, and then Lisa will come in third. Lisa graduated from Kincaid in 1993. She attended Tulane University and went on to receive her JD at the University of Houston Law Center. Um, after a stint in Vincent and Elkins, she served as the Director of Real Estate Services at the Texas Children's Hospital, where she created real estate service department in order to centralize the hospital's real estate operations. She currently serves um, as the Director of Public Affairs at, in Houston for HEB Grocery Company. When she's not representing HEB in the community, she's pushing kale smoothies, as I heard, um, to, to children all over underserved communities um, as the founder and board chair of Brighter Bites, which sounds like an absolutely wonderful organization. They've delivered over 38 million pounds of fresh produce and hundreds of thousands of educational material on, on better eating to over 400,000 individuals across the 125 participating schools, um, both here in Houston, but also Dallas, Austin, New York City, Washington, DC, and Southwest Florida. So I couldn't be more proud uh, to have those, uh, to have both Stan and Lisa joining us here um, uh, today. So I'll ask Stan and Lisa, they can mute their screens and I'll ask Carly to bring up our slides and then I'll, um, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about um, uh, me and then I'll, we'll go from there. So um, I graduated from Kincaid in 1985 and went to the University of Texas in Austin um, and then went to uh, uh, Baylor College of Medicine where I did my MD and my PhD training. Um, and then um, in 1996, uh, came up to Harvard at the Massachusetts General Hospital where I trained in both internal medicine and infectious disease. And I currently serve as an associate professor in medicine here, as well as the program director for the Department of Medicine residency program. And so what I'm hoping to do in the next um, uh, 10 minutes or so um, is to tell you a little bit about where we are with COVID-19 vaccines. The title slide of my talk says what we know at this minute, um, mostly because there's a lot of changing um, and evolving information in this particular area. So what I'm about to tell you is what I hope is current, but also recognizing that this is a highly evolving and dynamic area. Um, uh, following me will be Stan, uh, and then following Stan will be Lisa. And we're hoping to leave about 15 to 20 minutes to try to answer some questions. We appreciate all of you who uh, submitted your questions in the uh, prior to this session, but we also wanna give you the opportunity to ask questions while you're here. So there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen that you can submit questions there. And we will do our very best, recognizing that we're gonna hope, we're gonna end around, um, um, one o'clock, I have to think of my central time and East Coast time here, um, and around one o'clock so that we, uh, and then so we may not be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll do our very best uh, to do that. So um, uh, Carly, can I have the next slide? Excellent. So what, I, what I'm going to tell you um, is that as you think about uh, vaccines and the way we normally think about delivering vaccines, this is a timeline in terms of what um, vaccines uh, to other major infectious diseases have taken time from the time that you've, uh, I, uh, the agent is linked to the disease to when licensing actually took place. And so you can see here that um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is actually done in about 326 days, which for all of these major uh, diseases is actually one of the shortest times uh, that are there. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit about why we were able to accomplish that. Next slide. And so we're talking about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that, that causes COVID-19. Um, it is a um, RNA virus. And so you will see that there is, in the, and depicted in this cartoon, the blue part is, that is in the inside is the RNA. 
And for the purposes of this discussion, because we're going to focus more on the vaccine and not necessarily the biology, I want you to focus on that red, what appears to be a flower, which is a protein that's uh, called a, a spike glycoprotein. Um, many of the vaccines that we'll be talking about are developing um, an antibody response in the body to this glycoprotein, which is, um, which is a major constituent on the surface of the virus and is known to be the way the virus actually engages mammalian cells to gain entry into that cell. Next slide. And so the collaboration that we're talking about in terms of being able to do this in 326 days comes from the fact that we're talking about institutions all across the United States, as well as all across the world, coming together to work on a single project, which is the SARS-CoV-2, understanding its biology, and then using that information to be able to try to determine how to come up with uh, protective immunity. So that means partnerships across academic medicine, US government, industry, and philanthropy. And for someone who sits in that first bucket in academic medicine, I can tell you it's been historic to see the level of cooperation that has occurred between all of these uh, different domains as they have come together around a singular goal of ending this pandemic. Next slide. So I told you a little bit about this being an RNA virus. One of the things that you should know is that the first two vaccines that are out there, the ones Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, are what's called mRNA vaccines. And it's uh, um, the reason that we call them mRNA vaccines is that the agent that is injected is actually an RNA, which is, um, for, for those who might remember their biology, is the component um, of, the, of the DNA to RNA to protein part. It's essentially like that instruction manual on how you build a protein. So the goal in those two vaccines is for the body to get an instruction manual, i.e. the RNA, and then it allows it to build those, that uh, spike glycoprotein. That spike glycoprotein in isolation without all of the other components of the virus is incapable of causing infection, but the body recognizes that glycoprotein as not self and therefore will mount a particularly strong immune response. And we now know that when you develop an immune response to that glycoprotein S, um, we know that that then confers into protective immunity. What happens to that mRNA? The mRNA is essentially like an instruction book. So if I were to use the idea of um, building a bicycle for those who remember the old days, instead of going to the internet, you would actually get a book um, with your unassembled bicycle parts. That instruction book was the mRNA. You would assemble all those parts, you'd have your bike, and then what do you do with the instruction book? You throw it away. So the mRNA that's injected um, through these vaccines is actually degraded, um, we think, within typically hours to maybe a few days. Next slide. So I've gone through a lot of how this works. Just to highlight, mRNA um, tells the body how to make that spike protein. The spike protein is made, and then it goes into, uh, and, then, and then your body makes an immune response. That mRNA does not affect our own DNA. It's not included into our nucleus and it's not allowed to, it, it does not actually have the way or the capacity to actually um, uh, 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 integrate into our DNA. Um, and it cannot give us COVID-19 because it does not encode for the entire virus. Um, this is not, this is a new, but not a completely novel technology. Um, this has actually been in the works for about the last 10 or 15 years for things such as influenza, Zika, rabies, uh, CMV, as well as a number of cancer antigens, but this is the first time it's being used in a widespread effort like this. Next slide. So the, the, the landscape, and you're going to hear a lot more on the, on the Novavax from Stan, but I just wanted to share with you uh, where we are with uh, the other vaccines. I talked about a little bit about Moderna and Pfizer being this RNA platform. As you know, those are two shots, so it's given on day zero and either day 21 or day 28, depending on uh, which vaccine it is. Um, and then you can see that there's an AstraZeneca one, which is also built on a, pla a viral platform, which includes adenovirus, uh, Janssen and Janssen one, and then the Novavax, which we'll hear a little bit more about. Um, you may have heard a lot of information about the Janssen and Janssen one, Janssen, uh, Johnson and Johnson one because that is a single shot, and you can see in that column of timing, that's the one that has just the uh, zero day in there. Next slide. 
So as you hear a little bit more about how we go about this and, and some of the relevant things that, that Stan's gonna walk you through, it's important to have just a little bit of an understanding of how we do clinical trials here in the United States. So phase one, which is oftentimes with a small number of people are really trying to ask the question about whether this is safe. It's not asking the question about efficacy. It really is trying to figure out if there's any serious side effects. Um, and you can see some of the uh, other questions that we do uh, that we ask during that time. Phase two really starts to look at what are the most common short-term side effects and what is the body's immune response? And are there any signs that the vaccine is protective? It's usually not powered to tell us exactly whether it is or not, but it is gives us some idea of that. When you oftentimes hear about it in the news, you're hearing about what's called phase three, which is the largest part, one of the largest parts of this trial, where they're now taking uh, two groups of individuals typically and asking if we give one group the test vaccine and one group something else, it could be either um, uh, saline or in another situation, it could be another treatment. Um, what does the difference between those two populations look like? And in this particular question, they asked, how well does the vaccine protect people from disease? Phase four, which is oftentimes not described, is, uh, is one where we actually see where the vaccine is approved and there's ongoing data that we continue to learn a little bit about. Next slide. So I'm not gonna delve into the details here, but these are the, the type of data that you can find on the web. Um, these were both published in the New England Journal of Medicine. These are the efficacy for what you see on the left for the Pfizer and what you see on the right. So what they are looking at is the incidence of uh, developing COVID on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you can see time. And you can see that these curves, um, especially on the left, splay right around day 10, which is when we would predict the body starts to develop protective immunity. In these slides, you can see the rising one is those who received placebo and the flat curve that you see there are the ones that received um, uh, the vaccine. Next slide. Um, and so oftentimes when we do this, they are all looking to see what the side effects are. And the most common side effects we've seen are fever, headache, and muscle aches. Here at the Mass General Hospital, we've run a, a COVID clinic for um, both our patients as well as our employees um, since uh, uh, the later part of December. Um, and we've seen commonly fever, headaches, and muscle aches. We've seen um, in the now, I think, close to um, 100,000 doses that we've had, we've had two anaphylactic reactions uh, here, both which were uh, managed um, in the emergency department, both did not require hospitalization. Next slide. Um, oftentimes I'm asked about COVID vaccine in children. We're, right now the, the, the studies were uh, for the Moderna study included um, uh, participants 18 years or older and the Pfizer uh, vaccine study looked at 16 and older. So we don't have any trial data. Um, in clinicaltrials.gov, they have registered trials and we expect to have information um, by the fall about the reactivity for uh, folks that are in the uh, 10 to 12 to 18 range. Next slide. There is robust safety uh, vaccine monitoring. Um, many of these systems have been placed for other prior um, uh, vaccines, but I wanna point your attention to what's called vSafe, V-Safe. This is a new system that was specifically designed for COVID-19 and it allows us to use active surveillance. And when I say we, it's talking about the federal government uh, to use text messaging to, to initiate web-based survey monitoring. And it does telephone follow-up for anyone who reports medically significant events. Next slide. So there's lots that we do know. I just wanna be acknowledge the things we don't know. Um, many of the things that we're still actively working on is trying to understand the durability of our immunity. Uh, the question comes up, how long will this last? Um, we have some reasonable data to assume that vaccination is providing at least from blood work um, that it's producing a more vigorous response than natural infection. We're ongoing as with vSafe and other modalities to look on, at safety and efficacy for many of these. Um, and then the, one of the areas we're looking at is does this protect, we know it protects from severe disease, but does it protect from viral transmission? We want to understand how this works in both uh, immune function and dysregulation. Um, variants are obviously a big part, and I'm going to spend one slide talking about that. And we need to address healthcare disparities in vaccine uptake and distribution, as well as hesitancy. Next slide. So here's the uh, here's what I'd like to, to give you the take-home points on the SARS-CoV-2 variants. There are variants out there. The, these variants are, are, are natural and expected. This is what we typically see when we are dealing with uh, viruses. 
Um, there are three uh, variants that are circulating. There's reasonable data that they do increase infectivity and they do cause some increased severe infections. Uh, one of them is called the UK strain. You'll hear it as B117. The South African strain is B1351 and the Brazilian strain as P1. And if you can go to the next slide, these are all, go ahead and do the next slide, Carly. These are all right on that spike protein. So these are changes of the spike protein. And so that's why the VAC people uh, like Stan and others are thinking about whether uh, these things actually have an effect on their vaccine efficacy. We should put this into perspective. So this is data that came off two days ago from the CDC. So if you look at the three types of variants that I just told you, they've been reported in 3,081 and 15 cases. We recognize it's probably an underestimate of those uh, of the numbers, but probably not by too much. And I gave you the Texas numbers as of two days ago in terms of the number of variants that we've seen um, in Texas for these three variants. Next slide. One of the most important things that you miss when we, you hear about this is, is you, you, many people will focus on efficacy of the vaccine, but one of the things, and that's usually as it causes, as it is able to prevent infection, one of the things we're, uh, we, we as clinicians are hoping to do is take a potentially lethal disease and make it much more manageable. And so this slide really does uh, give you the opportunity to think about um, we have in these, these are all unqualified successes in the sense that we can dramatically decrease the number of hospitalizations down to zero, people who die um, from COVID down to zero. Those things are important parameters for us to continue to look forward to during a public health um, part. Next slide. Um, we uh, at the MGH have been working on a study right now to actually look to see, um, since our um, uh, employees are some of the first people who got the vaccine, to try to determine whether vaccinated people shed virus. And while I'm not here to report to you what that data is, because it's still going ongoing, I can tell you that we should have information about this very important question um, within weeks um, from a cohort of healthcare professionals. Next slide. Um, I've gone through most of those, so I'm just going to slip, skip to the next slide, Carly. So uh, many people ask me about COVID vaccination, and this is probably a better way to, to build protection. We've seen some correlates in the blood that suggest that vaccination is a better way to develop immunity than natural infection. So for those who ask me, you know, if I've had COVID, should I get the vaccine? My answer is yes. Next slide. Um, and then uh, and go on to the next slide, Carly. Um, what, now that you've been vaccinated, there are some new rules that have come out with from the from the CDC. Um, they're saying that people are fu fully vaccinated two weeks after their two dose series or two weeks after the Johnson and Johnson series. Um, and that's their definition of being fully vaccinated. Next slide. These are new guidelines that have come out from the CDC within the last couple of days. And they're saying, if you are vaccinated, you can gather indoors with other fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Um, you can gather indoors with vac unvaccinated people from one other household. Um, and then if you've been around someone who's had COVID-19, you do not need to then quarantine um, um, unless you develop symptoms. Next slide. What hasn't changed is in public, we're continuing to uh, social distance, wearing, uh, wearing masks and staying six feet apart. And the two determinant factors there are oftentimes the baseline transmission in a community and the percentage of people that have been vaccinated. And when those two parameters get down to acceptable levels, I anticipate that wearing masks and social distancing will become um, less, um, um, uh, uh, less necessary uh, for, uh, for, for maintaining uh, uh, or limiting spread of the infection. Next slide. And so I, I, I share with you that vaccines are not just the solution here, but they're part of the solution. And so what you are trying to do is use this as one example, how we actually um, separate the virus from, uh, the, from humans and uh, thinking about all of the different things that we do in public health to try to make sure that we're um, uh, trying to keep the public safe. And vaccines aren't the, the substitute, but they are actually part of our armamentarium. Uh, and next slide. I think that might be it. So um, without any further ado, why don't I ask Stan to um, bring his um, uh, camera back on and Carly will bring up his slides.
Jay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you covered a lot of ground. Some of the ground that I'll be covering, so I'll, so I'll uh, I think it, it fits well. Uh, if you go to my first slide, if you would, or the next slide. What I'll tell you a little bit about today is uh, how you make a vaccine. I won't tell you very much about it, but the basics. And then uh, more importantly is how you, once you make a vaccine, how do you test it? What are the data that you have to gather both for safety and for uh, efficacy? And then uh, some idea of, the, of what you have to do to make bucket loads of the vaccine once, once you get through the clinical trials. So if you go to the next slide, so we're designed to vaccine all of the vaccines that you hear about actually use the same premise. The premise is, is that you, you introduce this spike protein, uh, which is a pathogen, it's a protein found on this pathogen, surface of the pathogen, and, and the virus cannot survive unless that protein works. And so you try to use that pathogen, the spike protein, um, uh, as an antigen to stimulate an immune response against it so that if you do get infected with a real virus, that you'll have antibodies already that will block that spike protein. The spike protein can't attach to your cells. You can't, you can't get sick. So everybody's working on the same way. It's just different ways of giving uh, the spike protein. The way we do it is in this uh, graphic here, in that top center is, is we've got a gene sequence of the spike protein and, and we, we actually use uh, a uh, something called a baculovirus, which is a virus which infects cells. And we use a cell to grow up a lot of, uh, and inside that baculovirus, we put in the spike protein sequence for the spike protein. It infects this cell. It happens to be a, uh, an army worm cell. And it, it, the, the beauty of that cell is, is it grows up lots and lots of uh, uh, proteins in it. So we can make lots of spike protein. We purify it out and it forms actually trimers, it forms multiples of the spike protein, which, which actually look very much like the, the actual virus when it's actually made. And uh, that's the lower right-hand corner. And if you marry that up with something called a matrix M adjuvant, which is, um, which is a, a chemical formulation actually made from the bark of a tree that you find down in Chile, and combine those two and put it into a vial, then you've got the makings of, uh, of a vaccine. And it takes very little amounts of this vaccine to, to work. And so we use uh, just five uh, micrograms of, of uh, the protein uh, coupled with the matrix in this vial. And, and uh, a couple of things about it that make it um, especially attractive as a vaccine. One is, is that using those small amounts, you get a very, very robust, a very benign safety uh, uh, result. And number two, because the way we make it, we also, it's very stable. And so stability means that we don't have to freeze it once we make it, it, it is stable at, at uh, just standard refrigerated temperatures. And it makes it easy to ship uh, globally because, because it's important for this vaccine not to just get used in high income countries like the US and Europe, but it's got to get globally to stop the pandemic. and, and uh, we early on partnered with the largest vaccine company in the world, which is Serum Institute in India. And they make vaccines that get into two thirds of the kids in the world. And uh, so they know all of the low and middle income countries of the world. And so we partnered with them. And uh, so our vaccine will be uh, distributed uh, through them and through us. So, so what do you do? You, so you show that you, you've now got a vaccine and you have to show in animals first, uh, that it's work, that it works and it's safe. And how do you do that? The next slide gives you an example of that. And this is probably uh, one of the more uh, profound uh, uh, parts of our vaccine trial. And this is when we're just starting. This is in, in uh, macaques and in monkeys. And, um, and we found the world has found as they develop uh, vaccines, if you, when you, when you use non-human primates, and you get responses, you can generally test, trust that those responses will, will play out in humans. And in this particular trial, we started by, by uh, challenging, uh, vaccinating and challenging uh, uh, these monkeys on day zero. And, and what you see in the far left is those monkeys who got placebo, in other words, they got water, they had very high levels of, of, uh, of virus in their in their both their upper airways and in their lower airways, 
and which declined over time, but but still um, it's um, a lot of virus there. But when you use, and we, we were testing it in this particular study, we were testing two different doses of our vaccine. It showed you got something called sterile immunity and, and it's, it's the, it's uh, the hallmark of a great vaccine is if you can if you can get sterile immunity, what Jay was talking about is can you transmit vaccine from person uh, I'm sorry virus from person to person, and in this particular case, if you have sterile immunity, you can't, and so we don't yet know whether that sterile immunity will play out in our human trials, uh, but but at least we got it in non-human primates. We go to the next slide. What we're also trying to do and and. Uh, uh, is show that that um, these two doses. We're trying to pick a dose now, and so now we're now we're in humans, and we're doing a study which shows uh, um, we we give a dose at day zero and day twenty one. We want to show two things. One is we want to show that we get enough antibodies that it, in theory they'll be protective from disease. How do you know that? Well, one way to know that is when you test when you take plasma when you take sera from people who have already been infected which is that yellow bar down there is convalescent serum. So you're taking their, they've been infected, they've built up antibodies to the virus and they're presumed protective uh, next time around. So you wanna get levels of antibody in your vaccine above that. And as you can see uh, that we get in both the five microgram and the 25 microgram dose, uh, that we get levels that are far above that. And that's exactly what you wanna get. And, um, and then if you go to the next slide, we then tested in a uh, in Australia. And then go to the next slide, please. We did a phase one study in Australia, and in that phase one study, and this is the last time I'll show you two doses because from the study we selected, we determined that there's no difference between the high and the and the and the uh, uh, low dose, and so we go forward after this trial with low doses, which is which is great. Uh, so in, in effect, it gives you increases your capacity to manufacture product by fivefold. And again, you see the same sort of, of, of analysis, convalescent titers in humans. Um, and in this particular study, I'm showing this slide because we also were able to show uh, different time points down in three months and six months that those level of antibodies, even though they decline, they don't decline to a level that's below the convalescent serum. So they should be protective throughout that time. One thing it does tell you is, is that, that sometime uh, it's likely that you're going to want to get a boost. And whether it's at six months or 12 months, larger studies will, will tell you that. But, but, uh, but that's part of the data that we have right now. So from there, we progressed into what's called a phase two study in South Africa. Now, this study is the first study that's designed not just to show that you have an immune response, but that you, you have efficacy. And now we're doing a serious safety study and an efficacy study in over 4,000 people. And uh, my chief medical officer loves this particular slide. He says it's the best slide he's ever seen in his 40 year career of doing this stuff. So this is a, your safety profile and show what, you know, and you measure all kinds of things in these clinical trials in terms of safety. And in the vaccine group on the left and placebo group on the right, you can see the rates of, of, of uh, adverse events that were recorded, uh, severe, whether there were, um, uh, how many people discontinued the trial because, of, because they, they had some problem with the vaccine. And the vaccine actually did better than placebo. And so that was a really good sign that our vaccine has the safety profile that we want. And if you go to the next slide. So without going into all the details, what did we get in Africa, in South Africa, sorry. And so in the, in the, basically in the bottom left-hand corner, which is, the, which is the population that was the main population, which was 95% of the study, it, it's, it's all people in the study that were HIV uh, negative, and we got 60% vaccine efficacy. 60% efficacy is generally considered fairly good uh, for a new vaccine and for a respiratory vaccine. Flu vaccines, if they get 50 or 60%, uh, everybody would be happy about. It. We weren't particularly excited about it uh, because we had, you know, we, we knew at that point that Moderna and Pfizer had done very well with theirs and got in the 90 plus percent range. And so uh, we scratched our head and thought about, well, what, why is it only 60%? And it turns out what we found, and, and, and uh, Jay was just talking about variants, 
we we have we have we're now the only company with efficacy data against all three variant strains and the South Africa variant, the UK variant, and the original uh, Wuhan variant that came out. And so we looked at our trial, and 95% of the people in the trial had this what's called a triple mutant uh, uh, South African variant. And we thought, wow, our vaccine, which is made against the original strain and not the South African strain, actually cross protects. It cross protects pretty well against uh, the South African strain. So we got these data, and, and at the same time, we were running a trial in the UK. And if you go to the next slide, and the UK trial was a few days behind the uh, South African trial. And uh, so we were waiting with bated breath. See, this is an exciting drama I'm telling you about now. And so it's, uh, so we were waiting with bated breath to see what kind of data we got from our UK trial. And we got, what we found was, is in that trial, when we got, when we, we tested about half the trial participants were infected by the original Wuhan strain and half the trial were affected by the uh, UK strain uh, variant. And in the trial, in the group that got the uh, Wuhan strain, we got 96% vaccine efficacy. That's the highest number that's ever been reported. And then the, in, even in the variant, we got 86% vaccine efficacy. So that variant has, in, in effect, one mutation versus the South African, which is the triple mutant. And But in the overall efficacy of the trial, we got, if you mix the two groups together, about 90% efficacy. And so we did it. So we've got great data against uh, not only the Wuhan strain, the original strain, but the only efficacy data of a vaccine in, in uh, uh, with the other two strains. And, and the reason we have the only data is because we ran our trial when those strains were circulating. And if you go to the next, uh, yeah, and I'll get to that variant in a minute. So uh, go and So now we're doing a third efficacy trial which is uh, included in the United States. We started this trial uh, just about eight weeks ago, and we did. Uh, we we uh, brought in thirty thousand people, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, and and enrolled all thirty thousand people within six weeks. And <clears throat> excuse me. So and we're now in the position of gathering all the information, how many people were infected in placebo and how many people were infected in the vaccine arm, should have those data sometime in the month of eight, in April. But, but we already know uh, that, that the vaccine works it's incredibly well in, uh, based upon the UK and South Africa data. If you go to the next slide, so let's talk about variants for the moment. So I'm gonna give you three slides. And this particular one shows you over the period of the last year, it gives you graphically what variants were, were prevalent. Uh, and in the case of the uh, UK trial, you see where the green box is highlights, but then this, this covers the, the orange line, which is the UK variant, the orange uh, area is, is the UK variant. It shows about half the subjects in that trial were uh, infected by the UK variant. If you go to the next slide, it shows you that in uh, South Africa, uh, the South African uh, variant uh, was dramatically uh, increasing while we were doing the trial, and it, it covered 95% of the people that we were trying to protect. And then if you go to the next slide, this is the U.S. And so you see the variant that is coming up that the Jade referred to, and the U.K. variant is coming to the United States. It's moving so fast that I think people think that by the end of, uh, possibly by the end of April, it will be the dominant strain that circulated in the United States, which is the UK variant. Good news is, is um, even though our vaccine works a little less well uh, in the US, it's uh, our vaccine and others uh, should work very well against uh, the, uh, the UK strain that's now circulating in the United States. So summary, key, take key takeaways, 96% FC against the original Wuhan strain, 86% against the first variant that we, we determined was UK variant and 51% against the uh, South African variant. And, uh, and across all of these is a very favorable uh, safety profile. And that's critically important in vaccines. And unlike you know cancer therapy or therapy for, for other diseases, it's okay if your drug has some side effects as long as it works, but, in, but, but you're sick and, and your drug is gonna do something for you, you can, take, you can withstand some side effects. Vaccines, you're vaccinated a whole bunch of very well healthy people 
and you can't have uh, you can't have a bad side effect profile. So, so this is this is very good. So you go to the next slide, and so we've got a good vaccine. Uh, works well. It's safe. Um, it's stable at room temperature, so we can we can get it distributed. But you got to make bunches of it. And and so little old Novavax uh, as a as a uh, biotech company. This is a slide one year ago. We had our headquarters in in um, in Maryland, and we had in Sweden a place where we made this adjuvant that I was telling you about. That's all the capacity for manufacturing we had, and and so we knew we had to do something. So we got we got uh, through. We got a lot of funding from the U.S. government. We got a lot of funding from the Gates Foundation and from from other organizations. We got a lot of investor uh, interest. And then if you go to the next slide, we've now put in place. Uh, 10, 10 different facilities to make the spike protein and three different facilities to make the, the adjuvant and several facilities to, to make um, uh, packaging, fill and finish on a global basis. Because we didn't want to be in a place where, where borders close. Uh, if the US or some other country were to close their borders and we couldn't get our vaccine to the rest of the world, that doesn't help the pandemic uh, on a global basis. So we did this globally and now we have the ability that by the end of the third quarter, we should be able to make around 150 million doses a month. And uh, that gets it, that lets us get at the problem uh, uh, that we need to get to uh, over the coming year. What it will be is uncertain. I don't know how much of that production will be actually making variants versus making the original vaccine strain or whether it'll be a bivalence. But the beauty of our vaccine is at very small doses, we can make bi and trivalent vaccines much like you can make flu vaccines. And so with that, uh, I think I'm done. And that's how you make a that's how you make a vaccine. We have expectation is, is that we will accumulate all the data we have and finish the phase three trial in the US and in the next month or two we'll file for approval and uh, um, with uh, good data and maybe a little bit of luck we'll have the vaccine being shipped by the end of the second quarter. And you made a very hard um, pro uh, problem uh, sound quite easy. So thank you for that. Let me turn it over to Lisa. But uh, just before Lisa gets started, just a quick programming note. Uh, there are a number of questions that have been coming in. So we are going to continue till um, 1.15. Um, so just to try to be able to answer your questions and please continue to put them in the Q&A, but we will uh, go till 1.15. Lisa? Hi. Well, as life would have it, I am actually at Kincaid today on the HEB team, uh, vaccinating the staff and the faculty, and we are so thrilled to be here. I will tell you the response has been incredible. We're vaccinating 120 people today, and many of the faculty um, that you know and love, uh, they are so excited to be receiving this vaccine, and they are literally, some of them are in tears. Um, I think that this has been an emotional year for all of us, you know, hearing the science and how much has gone on behind the scenes to make this a reality for us to get to this point is absolutely incredible. And living through the pandemic every day, whether you're on the science side, whether you're like me on the front lines, or you're just living life, it is um, a very different world that we should all be commended for getting through. And we are very excited to be at this point. But as your local representative and someone here who lives here in Houston, I will say we are really far from over and we wanna make sure to continue to really live the way we've been living and take precautions until we get our vaccine doses up. So today, the epidemic in Harris County is still increasing. Our seven-day average is still about 500 cases a day. We're in the third wave of this, um, and we want to just make sure that we don't have any risk of plateauing at the high levels. So, you know, a lot of talk has been saying that the increase in testing, increase in cases is because of the increase in testing and that's not true. So we wanna make sure that not only is the vaccine rollout going on, but that we continue to test and we know, and so people are properly quarantining and not spreading. In terms of what's happening right now in Harris County, 
we only have 7% of our population vaccinated. Uh, about 8.4% in Texas have been vaccinated. We really need to get these numbers up to about 70% for herd immunity. And so it's really a race. I don't wanna speak for the scientists. Um, I have a dear friend and my partner at Brighter Bites, Sharila Sharma, she's an epidemiologist and we tend to talk about these things all the time. So, you know, as she would say, it's a race against the vaccination versus virus mutation. And the faster we vaccinate, the lower chances of mutation that we have. Um, the exciting thing is the last few months, it's been a little rocky rolling out the vaccine and receiving it, but now it's really starting to get underway. Last week, HEB received 51,000 doses across the state and 40,000 this week. I will um, let you know a lot of that is because now the federal government is giving us vaccine directly um, before we were just getting it from the state. And now we are receiving both state product and federal vaccine. HEB is only one of four um, providers that are um, qualified under the federal program. We feel very honored and privileged and, you know, obviously I'm biased, um, you know, as head of public affairs here in Houston, but we're really happy that we are in the back, getting so much vaccine now because we are in the communities where it's easy for people to be and to go. And, you know, we're bringing the vaccine to you. And I think that's really important, not just for you and me that are, you know, want to make it easier and not schlep two hours. I, I was working at a vaccine clinic over the weekend in Tomball. And when I was checking people in, um, who knew I would become expert temp taker to add to my resume. But when I was checking people in, I noticed that there was people from San Antonio, there was people from Florida, from Mexico, all over the country and even beyond coming to get this vaccine. And that was mind blowing to me, but I think that people really wanna take their health into their own hands, do it for themselves, do it for their family, protect themselves. And as I said, with HEB, it's really great because we're in your neighborhood and we can help you head on. Speaking of neighborhoods, um, you know, my job for HEB is in public affairs, part of what I do is really help our community in a philanthropic way and see what communities are at need, whether it's every day or it's in a pandemic or a disaster, this is where we hopefully thrive and can serve you. And one of the things, um, wearing my hat as HEB and Brighter Bites that I have been watching during the pandemic is how much harder the pandemic is, and COVID specifically, is hitting minority communities, black and brown, lower income communities. and. You know, some days we ignore, I did, you know, I am personally working on this every day in my career, but some days it's easier to ignore a community that's not part of our own, right? That um, we don't know a lot about, they're living separately. And, but with COVID, everybody's health affects each other. And that's why it's really important that every community gets vaccinated. We know that, that COVID has hit the Hispanic community, um, Harder. It's specific, double the rates of COVID diagnosis, complication, and death, only second to the Black community. Um, a lot of that is because there are underlying health issues, which we know that COVID attacks that more directly, and particularly obesity. You know, age, obviously, we've had a lot of talk, but obesity is one of the other highest comorbidities. And um, as someone who's dedicating their life to get fresh fruits and vegetables into lower income communities, you know, I knew and my team has known that these health disparities have existed in lower income communities for quite some time. And so daylighting this with COVID, it just, I hope that, you know, you never want to see a silver lining, but I hope that we take that seriously and we continue to work on prevention, whether it's for ourselves or underserved communities. And we focus on that. So we don't continue to have these disparities as other health issues um, that they come up. So, you know, the national data says that there is vaccine hesitancy among Black communities, um, as well as other minorities. And so we, as leaders of the community, have to work to change that. We have to educate and we have to advocate. 
And we have to bring the vaccine to where people are, whether it's through our stores or community programs like we're doing at Kincaid today. Uh, we have to make the vaccine easy to get. Uh, right now, in order to get the vaccine, you have to sign up online. And I don't know if anyone has been following the digital divide issues in our community. I think that everybody heard about it with kids and not having computers. And when um, school went entirely online, um, I think a lot of people stepped up, including HEB, to make sure kids did have computers. But the kids weren't the only ones that the pandemic affected in this way. And so right now, seniors and others in lower income communities are having issues signing up for vaccine. I am told literally that um, we released on last week, I think Thursday or Friday for our vaccine clinic in Tabal on Saturday for a thousand spots. We released the spots and in 30 seconds, all thousand spots were gone. And so if you are not as sophisticated as using the computer um, and or you are not in a job that allows you to have your browser open looking for these spots, it is going to be harder and harder um, for you to get a vaccine. I think it's getting easier because more is rolling out, but I think we as a community have to come together and um, like HEB and we will be going out into minority communities to make sure that we're both um, giving the vaccine and advocating. Um, so if there are any opportunities that you have where you do work in different communities around um, Houston or anywhere around the country that you can be of help, I think that is another thing that you can do to really help us um, get to this herd immunity level. And um, so I think things are looking up. I'm proud that we're able to vaccinate so many people HEB has all the immunizers we need to get people vaccinated already on staff. So we were excited that we could roll out in real time and make things like this happen. Um, and we will just continue to keep going until um, we reach the levels that everybody um, who has the vaccine, who wants the vaccine has it. So um, thank you. This is um, a great day to be at Kincaid watching this happen. It's a little bit of a wild day that this mass mandate um, was lifted today. Um, and we're hoping that everybody still does their part and wears their mask in our stores and around the community. Um, and that together we'll make this happen and we'll get life back to, back to a normal that we're comfortable with. So thank you for having me today. It's great to um, be a part of this esteemed panel. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. That that was uh, that was absolutely terrific, and I, I have to just echo uh, one of your comments or many of your comments uh, I, because I agree with so many of them. But um, as someone who has practiced um, and cared for a number of our patients, not only uh, on our floors um, but in our intensive care units, the disproportionate toll that that severe COVID has had on um, our black and brown population cannot, cannot be understated. Um, it, is a, it, is a, it is a significant part for anybody who has spent time in the hospital and have had to um, coordinate uh, family meetings over, um, over um, uh, WhatsApp or uh, FaceTime. Um, that has been one singular thing that has, um, at least in my memory, um, has been seared there over the course of the last year. Um, we do have a number of questions, uh, and uh, I would encourage the audience to continue to put questions um, in um, here to uh, to talk a little bit uh, 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 to, to ask. Um, maybe I would uh, just and Stan, if you don't mind turning on your camera as well, so that I know that um, that I can ask you questions as well. Um, you know, um, Lisa, I, I'll start with you, Lisa. There was a question about um, in terms of thinking about access to uh, access to vaccines. Um, not only in terms of uh, neighborhoods that may feel disproportionate, but what about rural communities and um, areas where they're not in an urban area? What 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 efforts do you think um, are, are are you aware of that are being made there to try to serve the rural community? Yeah, I think that specifically one of the four providers that um, was approved by the federal government in the state of Texas is serving the rural communities. It's um, a smaller group that has. Um, that's working on that specifically. So I think that that is great. Um, we hope that there are HEB pharmacies also in a lot of, in addition to them and a lot of HEB in a lot of rural communities. Um, and I, I would, you know, encourage others when there are, you know, communities that they know about where people aren't getting vaccinated 
to reach out to a large provider like HEB and see if they can do a vaccine event um, and coordinate it at a community center or somewhere that is convenient for people. Because that's the thing, you know, you and I can see a vaccine an hour away and drive there because we have that luxury. But in these rural communities or lower income, whatnot, that they might not have transportation, the things that we take for granted, they just might not, or they might be older population. And so it really is a real issue. And um, I encourage people to look into that or if they work with any nonprofits or government entities to work with the providers. Right. I think it's so important that those communities continue to engage in the vaccine efforts because oftentimes some of the ICU and hospital capacity in those areas are particularly stretched. And so um, now is the time to, as you said, engage in with those uh, with those uh, groups to try to see if that vac the vaccine um, um, is available in there. Stan, I wanted to turn to you and see, um, uh, I'm assuming just below the screen that we can see you have a crystal ball there. So I'm, I'm glad you have that there so you can tell me the answer to this question, <laughs> um, which is um, now that we're, we're gonna start to see more vaccines on the market, when are we gonna get to a time where the community, the US community, the Kincaid community, the Houston community can, um, can know that there's going to be, uh, let's say, no limitation in the vaccine availability, like uh, where, where, where vaccines are not the, the amount of vaccine is not the limiting factor in terms of getting the vaccine. Do you, do you have a sense as to when that might, be, might happen? Well, it's a, it's a good question. The answer's a little complicated, I'm afraid. My crystal ball isn't any better than anybody else's. I think the problem is, is that, that the vaccine community and the, and the healthcare community have, have done regardless of all the headlines you see, your first slide showed we've got a vaccine out from gene sequence to a vaccine approved in a, in a year. I mean, that's just remarkable. And so it's it's getting out. It's getting out more and more every day. We're now in March. I think uh, the president uh, uh, predicted that by May, there would be enough vaccine for everybody who wanted it in the US. It's US now, not everywhere else. Um, and, uh, and that may be close, and so it may be May or June or July. The conundrum is, is we don't know what, uh, number one, we don't know how long the vaccine is going to last, so therefore, do you, does everybody need a boost? And if so, do you need a boost at six months or do you need it a year? And secondly, with the variant coming around, do we then need to boost with a variant possibly, or, or possibly a, a bivalent vaccine, which has both the variant and the original strain to boost? And all those are going to be data-driven decisions and those data are, are going into clinical trials. We are, Moderna and Pfizer, and everybody are, uh, over the coming months, and we'll have data in the summer. Uh, the capacity, the good news is the capacity is there now to, to, uh, to start making it. And the, in, in our case, and I think others, to be able to make the variant is using the exact same technology that we use to make the original vaccine. And so it's just a matter of switching over like you do when you make a new flu vaccine every year. So I think there's going to be a lot more vaccination, but but it's not coming from a base of zero. And and uh, so you're, you're boosting and, and boosting responses are typically very important and very protective. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And I, I, I would just add to that that, you know, I think um, surveillance is going to be an ongoing um, issue. So we'll need to continue to make sure that we have good and robust systems to continue to surveil our communities to see whether um, variants emerge, uh, whether those start to actually come up. And so I know that there's a number of things that are that are being done right now um, in terms of exist using existing networks to try to make sure that we do surveillance. Lisa, um, you know, if, if someone comes around and, 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 is in, and, you know, has an opportunity to interact with, let's say, a community that might be um, vaccine hesitant or an individual that, 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 is, has, um, that, that demonstrates some vaccine hesitancy, what are the things that you do to actually talk to them about, you know, um, encouraging them and what information or what facts do you give them to kind of help them um, arm them to make a more informed decision? I think the number one we thing we can do, not me personally, but anyone in these communities, um, when you're re when you're working with vaccine hesitant people, is for the leaders in the community to show that they're getting the vaccine. You know, much like the president of the United States had went on, and um, our governor, and um, but also at a more local, like a micro level, um, whether it's do they trust their church and their pastor. Is there a community figurehead with a nonprofit 
all of these people that they have personal relationships, if they can see that these they feel close to, whether they're an expert or they have, you know, akin to, that they see them getting vaccinated, they'll feel much more comfortable about getting vaccinated themselves. It's such a trust factor. And here's the thing, it's never based on fact, right? Because all the facts that you talked about, Jay and Stan, and the amazing science, like we should all feel safe getting this vaccine, right? And we should all be excited that there's an opportunity to protect us from COVID. And factually, to have the vaccine and have a little bit of a side effect versus I mean, I personally had COVID, so I get it, and I wasn't the worst case, and I still would never want to wish that on my, get it again, or wish it on anyone else. So it's not a factual situation here, and so I think it's reasoning with people to understand, to protect themselves, to protect others, and then to really go by the data and, and make it simple, right? But I think it's a trust factor, and if you can, I mean, I even saw it amongst, um, some HEB partners when there was some extra vaccine on Saturday and they were hesitant and to see that the conversations going on in their head about receiving this vaccine and who they trust, they called a family member. The family member did not have a scientific background, but they trusted this family member. And so that's why I say it's these trusted relationships. And that's why we have to go very local, very deep into the community. And like, for example, if we can run a clinic like we did today in a lower income neighborhood um, where people are already going like a church or a community center and there's a leader from that community, they're so much more apt to get the vaccine. And that's what really excites me about more vaccine coming online and that we can go out and do that at HEB or anyone else to go deep into the community and make it easy. Couldn't agree more, Lisa. And I, I guess I would say I've, I've tried to do my best uh, and my part in terms of talking to a number of different individuals, um, in both in my community and as far as my Zoom reach can, uh, can go. And I've been amazed by um, some of the questions that I've received, um, including a question that I got not too long ago, which was, um, I was told that there's pork in the vaccine. That's not a true <laughs> statement, but but for someone who who is um, has certain uh, religious preferences, that would be a that would be a non-starter for them. But they were convinced because they had heard from what they thought was a trusted person that 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 was that that's why we shouldn't get the vaccine. And so I do think there's uh, also in addition to the facts, I think there's also an opportunity to to correct some misinformation there as well. And so, I think we just have to be really really quick. This whole pandemic has created so many emotional issues for all of us. And if we can just show empathy towards that and a little kindness and understanding that we might have to go the extra mile to convince people or to advocate and be examples and just do lead with that kind that empathy measure, I think we'll go a lot farther than just kind of forcing things on people. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. Um, Stan, I wanted to go back to you about vaccines. Your platform and, and platform of other companies um, have, you know, largely have been focused on infectious disease, but the promise of vaccines also include things uh, that are non-infectious disease. So things like cancer um, and potentially Alzheimer's people have used uh, in terms of this. Can you kind of explain a little bit in terms of how vaccines might be used for the purposes of cancer or for other non-infectious disease uh, purposes um, that might be, um, that, might, that might actually drive um, kind of ongoing development of vaccines? Sure, there are lots of applications that are just in their infancy, but it's, it's what you're doing is stimulating or improving on an existing immune response. Uh, and uh, in, you know, in cancer, you could be targeting some of your own proteins where you want to, where you want a vaccine to turn off a receptor on a cancer cell that is that is inhibiting uh, the immune system's attack on that cancer cell or, or do vice versa. So either to turn on, so you can stimulate uh, as opposed to giving drugs and they can be, they can actually turn out to be very specific uh, uh, stimulators or, or you know, the opposite, turning off uh, cells. And I think that that's true in a number of different areas uh, in neurologic disorders that we haven't even begun to really explore yet, but, but uh, it's it's a sense of it's it's just it's the difference between introducing chemical drugs or even biologic monoclonal antibody drugs that are external to the body as opposed to letting your body uh, control its own uh, uh, disease. 
Yeah, it's a, there's a, a number of wonderful applications that where we've been able to manipulate the, or take advantage of, let's say the immune system for the purposes of treating cancer. There's some really breathtaking data in that particular area and how vaccines will fit into that, I think is gonna be really exciting in the future. And so um, I certainly am very optimistic on how um, you and others are gonna be able to kind of um, bring those to our armamentarium as we, as we care for patients. Um, the two questions that are in the Q&A that I'm going to try to combine, one is talking about um, uh, overseas travel, um, you know, and the other one is um, talking about uh, returning back to life as normal concerts, traveling everywhere with, uh, and large gatherings. And um, I certainly would say that that is the dream, right? That's where we're hoping to go to, and that's where we would love to go. You know, I guess I would just say that th this is a concept that I've, I've talked to, to others, including the trainees here at this hospital um, uh, and, uh, and my colleagues here. I, I call it COVID recovery. So in the sense that I would say that this, what we're, what we're doing is not looking for the light switch, which gets us back from where we were in this current state, back in flipping into what is considered normal. But we actually are now starting entering into what I would call a recovery phase. And we just have to recognize that if, as we as a society, um, and if we use the analogy of a patient, if we've been sick for a year, we're not, we can't really just jump up out of the hospital bed and just go running around and running marathons and doing all the things we did before we got um, sick. We are in a process of actually going through recovery. And that's gonna be sometimes um, wonderful and, 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 and see progress on a very uh, short scale, but sometimes that, that can be frustratingly slow. And perhaps maybe the guiding principle there is it's sometimes uneven. And so I guess I would say is, as we start to think about overseas travel, it has a lot to do with what the prevailing rates are in those areas. Stan had brought up the kind of the variance and, and, and what we would expect the protection to occur from the vaccines that, that we've currently delivered here in the United States and how that may impact the circulating strains in those particular area. And then going back to, to traveling everywhere, concerts and large gatherings are largely gonna be dictated by the percentage of individuals who are vaccinated um, and the prevalence of the, the circulating strains that are in that community. And that may mean that, you know, um, you know, Harris County may be different than the than than uh, than Fort Bend County. That may have very different things in terms of what's happening in Boston and in 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 New England to what's going on in Los Angeles. So we'll have to pay attention to these things as we kind of move forward, and that will complicate the kind of like the one size fits all answer we're all hoping for. You know, as we kind of um, as we kind of um, hope and 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 think a little bit about that as well. Um, um, so. Uh, let me just, I'm going to, I'm going to try to read and do at the same time. How long does one, uh, does someone have to wait to receive the first dose of vaccine following having, uh, how, so how long does someone have to wait to receive the first dose of vaccine um, uh, after having COVID? Um, so the, the, right now, the current recommendation is that you should be completely recovered from your, uh, uh, from your disease. Um, I, we originally thought, I think it was around eight to 12 weeks um, uh, after the complete recovery. I think that there's some interim guidelines that are now starting to shorten that. Um, but the goal right now is that you have to be fully recovered from your, you cannot have a fever and you cannot have any ongoing symptoms that are um, associated with that as well. Um, so uh, I so I will. Uh, we're 13 minutes o uh, um, over, um, and then I would like to just uh, say that I think we're we've uh, or 13 minutes past the hour. I think we've um, um, hopefully have um, provided you with some information about COVID. I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, both Stan and Lisa joining me on the stage here to um, to go over uh, what we know at this minute. Um, I couldn't be more proud of the Kincaid community and the community in Texas, as well as all of us, as we continue to try to do our part to end this COVID pandemic. And I hope that you um, uh, will join us in that effort, because as Lisa said, this is going to take all of us and all of our efforts uh, to bring everybody to where we need to be so that we can open up safely uh, and finally put an end to this uh, COVID pandemic. So let me uh, turn it over to either Carly or Tom to see if they have any other last minute things that they wanted to um, include here as well. But uh, again, thank you very much.